Hey everybody, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter here with Jared Stein, Zach, and Carly from the Pronto team talking today a little bit about how to keep students connected during this difficulty that everybody's facing. I'm gonna, I know all of you know Jared, he's a bit of a celebrity on the Canvas side and in the community, but, can't, but Jared, let's hand it off to you and good luck everybody, have fun. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I've got a couple of folks who I've known for quite a bit of time. I'll introduce in just a moment, but we are going to talk about how we can keep students connected at a distance. That's whether you're teaching a fully online course or you're suddenly adapting to remote teaching or you're helping teachers or faculty adapt to remote teaching in the wake of campus closures. So let's begin with some really brief introductions. I'm Jared Stein. I'm the VP of Higher Ed Strategy here at Instructure. I've been with Instructure for over eight years. And prior to that, uh, my entire background was in higher education, helping faculty develop blended and online courses and programs. Carly? Hey, good morning. My name is Carly Techmeyer. I'm the VP for Education Sales at Pronto. Uh, Jared and I actually go way back. Uh, prior to joining the Pronto team about a year ago, I worked in Instructure for seven years. And uh, don't tell anybody, Jared, but you definitely were my favorite person to present with. So excited to be alongside you doing this again. Zach? All right, my name is Zach Mangum. I am one of the co-founders at Pronto and I'm currently the CEO and uh, have known Carly now for goodness about a year since just before she joined our team and Jared for a couple and uh, excited to be, be here with you guys today. So I want to talk by or start by talking about a, a story from my own past when I was uh, an online and hybrid course teacher at Utah Valley University. Uh, one semester, I started a course that was a hybrid course for the very first time. That is, it was uh, it was two thirds online. So instead of meeting three times a week, we had planned to meet just once a week and have the other learning activities and interactions happen online. Now, hybrid courses at this time were very new for Utah Valley University, and we didn't actually advertise them as being hybrid in the course catalog. So uh, it wasn't too much of a surprise to me when the first week of class, one of my students came up to me after the session, and she was very, very concerned about this idea of doing some of the activities online. And when I say concerned, what I really mean is she was actually angry. She felt like she had been misled when she signed up for the course. Uh, she was expecting to meet three times a week as she did in most of her other classes. And when I asked her about you know, what, was, what were her concerns, she said that basically she liked having that time where she could be with her classmates. She felt like interact in that face-to-face -face environment were really valuable to her. And through that conversation, it reminded me of some of the things I've seen in research on uh, transactional distance and students' feelings about learning online. This idea that it is very, very easy in an online situation to feel isolated, uh, to, to feel that it's less human because it is less distant. And sometimes when there is a lack of interaction to feel less supported. So I tried to assure the student that the hybrid course, we would definitely make the most of the face-to-face -face time that we did have, but that even in the online learning activities, there would be a high level of social interaction. And for me, as I think about blended and hybrid courses in particular, it's not a question of what happens face-to-face versus what happens online. It's really a question of creating a continuous activity stream, a series of interactions that are tightly linked and interconnected so students don't ever feel disengaged or disconnected from the learning or from each other. And a lot of research backs up this idea that interaction is essential for ensuring quality in online education. Uh, when we think about online education in the United States, a couple of things really stand out. One is a lot of research that compares directly face-to-face -to, -face to online uh, learning 
and finds no significant difference in terms of student learning outcomes. And in some cases, hybrid or blended options are in fact more effective than either fully online or face-to-face. -face. Um, but there's no significant difference by and large. And yet we know that many higher ed faculty are much more resistant to teaching online. Their opinion of online is much poorer than it is of face-to-face. -face. Uh, about a third of faculty have ever taught online and about the same amount say that online can be as good as face-to-face. -face. And that perception that online isn't as high quality as face-to-face -face, isn't limited to just teaching faculty. Students tend to have that opinion too, although uh, at a lower rate, and so do administrators, although that seems to be changing. And when you dig into some of the reasons why that perception of online education uh, is lower than traditional face-to-face, -face, it tends to come back to this idea of interaction. It tends to come back to this idea that when, when, we, when we are face-to-face, -face, it is a very human experience. We can see each other's expression. We can hear each other's voice. There's that level of fidelity there that it's hard to capture when you're talking about text-based online. Uh, and also, it's what we're used to. It's the norm. So even though face-to-face uh, -face classes may have very different levels of interaction, uh, it is the norm and it is what we expect. And so as we face this current crisis in the United States and around the world, where colleges, universities, even K-12 through schools are closing campus and trying to switch to remote teaching or emergency online teaching, as I've, I've heard it referenced. Uh, this is a big challenge for us. How do we help faculty and teachers transition to online education and make it a good experience for them? Preserve some of that interactiveness that they enjoy and they value, and that students value too. But how do we do this in such a way that uh, it's responsive and our work is efficient because we really don't have any time. Many institutions of higher ed, as you can see in this chart, are already, are already closed in terms of the physical campus and have moved all of their courses to online or remote teaching. And so this chart comes from Phil Hill of Mindwires. And you can see he's predicting that in just a few weeks, nearly every higher ed institution in the US will have moved from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to some kind of fully online. So it's happening super, super fast. And with most faculty having never taught a fully online course and maybe having a negative perception of it, it's a real challenge for us, for us who are set to uh, support those folks in terms of promoting a positive attitude and helping them capture some of that level of interaction and that quality experience that they're, they're used to providing in the in the face-to-face -face classroom. I think Ryan Craig said it really, really well. For any teacher who's moving from traditional face-to-face -face instruction to online, it really is like moving to a foreign country where you must learn a new language and assimilate a new culture. Now, one of the things that many uh, professors are doing as a way of transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And, and I'm not opposed to this, actually. I think it's, it's a really great way um, to make that transition quickly and painlessly is through video conferencing, where essentially they are transferring uh, what they've done in their face-to-face -face -face environment to the online environment using live video conferencing and scheduling uh, live sessions. So I think this is fine as a first step. And I think uh, as you know, a lot of instructors are kind of scrambling to get their feet under, under them, this feels like the natural response. But I think there are some challenges with using this as your only response or, or the be all end all of your efforts to promote interaction and kind of recapture that feel of face-to-face -face instruction. Here's one of those drawbacks. As anyone who's taught a face-to-face -face course recently or has taken one recently, uh, we might be overestimating the level of interaction that we're actually able to have with our students. Now, certainly looking out on a classroom, we can see their faces, we can 
register their understanding or perhaps their emotion. And we are able to very quickly bring them together into small groups or into pairs to do work socially. Uh, but just because they're all in the same place at the same time doesn't mean that they're all focusing their attention on the instruction or on the activity. Let me give you this really quick example, which talks about some of the limitations and some of the strengths of these two ways of teaching. 1.5 seconds. 1.5 seconds is the average amount of time that a teacher in a face-to-face -face class waits after asking the class a question before they call on somebody or provide the answer themselves. 1.5 seconds is not very long. Now, a number of studies who have looked at this tried asking the teachers to wait just a little bit longer, three seconds. And I'm gonna pause for three seconds so you guys can feel what that feels like. In a presentation, three seconds can feel like a lot of silence. It can actually feel very uncomfortable, but researchers have found that when teachers extend the amount of time that they wait after asking the class a question, that increases the diversity of students who respond, the quality of the responses. And this really points to a, a major limitation of live synchronous interaction in face-to-face -face environments uh, that online allows us to avoid. And that's that when you are in the same place at the same time, or even online at the same time, your major constraint is time itself. You don't have all of the time in the world to one, wait for each student in the class to register your question and think about a response. Two, to kind of race with each other to see who gets their hand up first. And three, you certainly as the instructor don't have the time to allow every student in the class to share their thoughts, their ideas, or their answer, let alone to go on different tangents. And this is really why online education has steered away from synchronous as the primary mode of delivery and has favored asynchronous communication and interaction. Uh, now, there is a place for synchronous, uh, so let's compare some of the, the strengths of each of these really quickly. When we talk about asynchronous, we're really just talking about not being in the same place at the same time, or really just not being together at the same time. It's the sort of experience you have in discussion forums or even via email or in new tools that allow you to, to come back because they have persistent chat. Asynchronous tends to be more participatory in that you're allowing every student a chance to uh, provide their, their input, their information, and have that reacted to. It's more flexible because, of course, students can come into in this activity active because when a question is posed, students have a chance to think about it, to refer to other materials, and perhaps draft and, and redraft a response. And it does also intend to encourage extensive or discursive discussions that go deeper or even go down uh, rabbit holes that can be quite delightful for students and teachers alike. Now, some of the strengths of synchronous interaction include that it's familiar. Being together in real time feels natural. It also is immediate. And that immediacy uh, can be really rewarding for students. And it can be energizing as well. Anytime you're in a conversation, or whether that's group or one-to-one, -one, that sense of immediacy and the ability to respond, and even just that thinking quickly on your toes can be very energizing. And I think that gets to some of the dynamic aspects of it. You know, Part of what uh, I've heard from instructors is that they love a face-to-face -face environment because it is less planned, and it can be uh, more dynamic and spontaneous. And finally, synchronous interactions can tend, or do tend to be more focused because you have the entire group in the same moment thinking about the same topic. So helping instructors understand the strengths and the limitations of 
asynchronous and synchronous communication, I think is a major tool for us in helping them transition to online or remote teaching uh, that is interactive and still rewarding. Now, there's a story that we captured uh, at the University of Auckland, one of our Canvas customers, where the instructors and the students talked about how technology helped them learn. And one of the things that was very remarkable to me to hear uh, from the teachers and from the students is that cultural differences uh, sometimes prevent students or inhibit students from speaking up in a face-to-face -face environment. And so as you can see in this quote, having a little bit of transactional distance uh, between the students and the teacher can help them feel more comfortable when they need to ask a question, when they need to ask for help. And so one thing I want to suggest is that even though our instinct is that online teaching is more distant, that distance isn't always bad. We, we want to be able to create that increased flexibility for each and every one of our students. And I think online communication can help us do that. One last point that I wanna, I wanna leave you with, and then we're going to transition to how this all relates to uh, what, what Canvas and Pronto do together, is that there really are three main kinds of interaction that teachers can facilitate for learners, whether that's face-to-face -face or online um, or at a distance. And these three main types come from Michael Moore's work. It's learner to content interaction, where learners are engaging with written or video material or other sorts of activities. It's learner to teacher interaction, where teachers are responding to students' requests, learners are in class together and registering what the teacher says on their faces or through their responses. And then finally is learner to learner interaction. And I think if you took any particular course, you could measure the quantity of content, teacher, learner interaction in that course and find very different balances or ratios from one to another. When we're used to teaching in a face-to-face -face environment, we're very much focused on that learner to teacher interaction, or really it's, it's often teacher to learner interaction. Um, but because of the limitations of time, uh, that interaction is going to be pretty limited itself. Now, I think when we think about online teaching and learning, our minds tend to focus on that learner to content interaction because online education is an extension of distance education, uh, which was born from independent study, which is over a hundred years old. And that focus on the content and the curriculum and the development of knowledge tends to be at least central in our minds, even if it's not true in the reality of, of most online courses today. So in addition to helping instructors think about the differences, the strengths and the weaknesses or limitations between synchronous and asynchronous communication and interaction, we should also encourage them to think about the ratios of learner to teacher interaction, learner to content interaction, and learner to learner interaction, which we're seeing is much more important. How can they leverage technology to achieve the right balance of these three kinds of interaction in their course? And which of these interactions are best done asynchronously or synchronously for different learning objectives or for different learning activities? Now, research does make three pretty broad recommendations for how teachers should support interaction in an online environment. And that's number one, through clear communication, both in the instructions and the directions. It's a clarity and it's a conciseness so that students aren't overwhelmed or distracted. Second is teacher presence. Now this means that the teacher is regularly seen and heard that they have a very human aspect to them, that they don't come off as, as robots, uh, and that there is a level of immediacy. Their responsiveness to student needs is very consistent and felt by every student in the course. And the third is peer interaction. Uh, some research has shown that just a purely social foundation for a course 
goes a long way in helping students engage early on in building a community and helping to motivate them throughout the remainder of the course. But peer interaction is also super powerful in terms of supporting learning, helping students to discuss their understanding and share their knowledge to help them feel engaged and motivated uh, from their interactions with each other. So these are the three takeaways that I would encourage you to use, whether you are a teaching uh, faculty member or you're supporting instructors as they transition to online and remote teaching. Now, I'm really excited today to introduce my friends from Pronto. As Carly mentioned, her and I have worked together for a long time. And Pronto is one of uh, Instructure's partners uh, in our Canvas ecosystem. So I'm gonna give Carly a chance to talk about how Pronto in, uh, 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 integrates with Canvas, but uh, also to talk a little bit about one of the things that they've produced recently that kind of connects to some of these ideas that I've shared from research and practice on online education around fostering student interaction, especially if you are new to online instruction. Thank so you. let me turn it over to Carly and Zach. Thank you so much, Jared. It has certainly been a very stressful and chaotic last couple of weeks for the instructors that we've worked with. And I have to say, I think amidst all the chaos, what's been really moving has been how folks have been coming together, right? Individuals, entire communities, businesses, schools. I mean, we hear everything about, you know, cruise lines that are offering up their ships as these makeshift hospitals and crafters that are making caps and masks for healthcare workers and even restaurants that are providing free meals for families in need. And it's really beautiful. And um, I think as we all kind of reflect back on what we can do to help, I am proud that we at Pronto have been able to take a look at how we can play a part in that and help institutions as they rush to move online. So Zach, would you mind sharing really quickly what the last couple of weeks has looked like for us? Yeah, it's been chaos. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a pretty pretty interesting time because you know a few weeks ago, we noticed that um, there was this sort of shifting conversation with a lot of the schools that we were talking to that were contemplating a, a deployment of Pronto at their campus. and instead of a, uh, you know, we're gonna evaluate this in due time, it turned into a huge sense of urgency. We need to figure out something and we need to do it now. And it was, it seems that every day is, feels more like a month or a year right now as things are constantly changing in the world. But we, we learned really quickly that we, we were in a position to be able to help and gives give schools and professors and students an opportunity to make this transition from being present face to face to being still present but but remotely um so we felt like it was best to just push pause and and see how we can help and that's kind of hard in a climate like this when you're a business that has employees that need to get paid and and everything else but we've been we've been really fortunate i think that we've positioned ourselves to be able to help without hurting um, the health of our business. And that's that's a huge win for, for us and, and the different schools that are electing to deploy Pronto right now. So Carly, I, maybe I pass the time back to you and I could touch on what exactly we're doing towards the end of the, the webinar here. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I uh, I think the last time I checked, I saw that we had about a half a million students <laughs> that came on last week. Is is my number right, Zach? Yep, that many and uh, and counting kind of oh. daily. It's a it's a pretty aggressively moving number right now. Yeah, no, it has been amazing. And I think there was that really big rush to online. And now that we've had a couple of weeks, I see institutions kind of sitting back and okay, now we're in this for the long haul. How are we gonna do this? And um, when I think about online, I think back to my first attempt at taking an online course. And I regret to say that I logged in, I think twice before I dropped the course completely. And there were a couple of reasons for that, but I think the biggest one was really that feeling of isolation, right? Uh, being disconnected from my teacher, from my peers, and really from the learning experience. And I said, oh, this just isn't gonna work for me. And now we find ourselves uh, in a situation where we are mandated <laughs> to be isolated. So what do we do? You know, how are we helping support teachers and how are we um, helping students to stay motivated and engaged? So 
Um, we actually did something because we know that this is unfamiliar territory for a lot of instructors. Uh, so we actually put together a kind of quick start checklist for instructors using Pronto. Uh, Jared, would you mind popping that up on the screen? Awesome. So this will actually be available uh, for download. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll provide a link so that you can take this and share it with faculty you're supporting. If you're an instructor, you can use it within your own course or even share it with your colleagues. Uh, but really this is, hey, once you have Pronto integrated with your LMS, of course, it'll be beautifully set up, but how do we communicate with students on how to communicate moving forward? Um, staying connected can be a challenge, but with Pronto, we wanna make it super easy with these four quick steps. Uh, really Really, this is about how do we tell students that this is the preferred communication channel? How do we set them up in groups where they can have focused, contextualized conversations? Um, how do we communicate what the expectation is for how we're leveraging this with the other tools that we're using as well? And we know that the LMS is going to be leveraged heavily. We're probably using virtual conferencing tools as well, but we want to keep those conversations going. And Pronto can really be a great piece to do that in a way that is human uh, and really providing other opportunities to have that face-to-face -face like interaction as well. Um, what I'd love to draw the most attention to is the teaching pro tips when you have a second to download that and review those. I'll be incorporating some of those into the product demonstration because I think that's where actually uh, the real kind of meat of this is. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll dump, jump into a demonstration of Pronto. Thank you, Jared. Uh, we're actually going to start with the mobile experience, and then I will jump over to uh, the integration with Canvas as well. All right. Jared, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can now see it. Wonderful. So I'm just doing this directly from my phone. What's great about Pronto is it's really meant to be a fantastic mobile experience. Uh, one of the things we have to think about as we move to this online environment is how do we be super accessible and equitable as possible? We have a lot of students that may not have a laptop or they have really poor internet connection. So how do we make sure that we are providing an experience for them that they can have on a 3G network, right? So Pronto has mobile apps that are available, iOS and Android, and you don't even have to be on the latest and greatest technology to have a fantastic experience. So making sure that it's financially accessible as well. Uh, we support, for example, all the way down to an iPhone 4 which is pretty fantastic. Uh, so coming into this app, the first thing I wanna point out is what we call the tray. This is how groups are organized within Pronto. Um, these will come over automatically through an integration with the LMS. So your courses, your sections, and any groups, if you're leveraging those in Canvas, will come over automatically. But you also have the opportunity to create groups in Pronto. So you can see I can create groups for working in uh, group projects with other students. I can create social groups as well. Jared, you mentioned the importance of social interaction, especially in a time where we are social, uh, distancing ourselves from each other. So this is something that uh, you can allow students to create their own groups. Of course, that can be turned off at an institution level if that is concerning. Uh, but even as a teacher, to be able to create these ad hoc. Uh, you can also see the ability to enter a group code. Uh, if you are allowing students to use it for social purposes, this is a wonderful experience for them to say, hey, we're doing a book club. Uh, anyone who wants to join, enter this group code, and then they can kind of self-register into that group. Uh, also, we have the ability to direct messaging as well. So coming into one of these group spaces, you can see this is just the classroom chat. So as an instructor, I can come in and offer words of encouragement, reminders about things that are coming up. I can share files and pictures, um, and even the ability to do GIFs, and those are just a simple tap away. So I can share any photos that are in my library. I can even do a quick video. So when we talk about that human experience, uh, there is a big difference between saying, hey, everyone, it, you know, I miss you all, but looking forward to a great lesson next week. And there's a difference between that and recording a quick video of yourself where they can see your face and your smiles and hear your tone. Uh, and it's just a great way to kind of mean that, maintain that connection with your students and do it in a quick and easy way. Uh, but we also have the ability to upload files. So this will allow me to bring in files from my repository here on my phone, but I can also connect to any other file uh, cloud repositories that I have available as well and easily drop those in. Uh, once we have shared a file to the group, we actually create a repository here within Pronto. So I can easily access those very similar to what we have on the iPhone, where I can access photos and videos, 
perhaps even links or files that have been shared as well. So you can see those here. Uh, these are downloadable, so I can view these offline if connectivity is an issue for me. Uh, one thing that I really appreciate about the mobile experience is how easy it is to drop things right into Pronto. So for example, in my economics class, one of the big uh, topics here is how COVID is affecting the economy. So I have this article that I wanted to share with my students and create a conversation around this, a good way to keep them engaged and keep that conversation going. Uh, directly from the browser, I can actually share this to Pronto and drop it right into the, the group that I've created specifically to have that conversation. So very easy to drop that in and that'll show right here uh, within that Pronto group. And we can now start a conversation uh, with these students. Uh, we also really encourage students to have these self uh, or encourage students to start their own discussions around certain topics. So you can have groups that are topic specific and really focused and separate from that main classroom space. Uh, you'll also notice that we have group project spaces. Again, if these are set up within Canvas, these will come over automatically. But this is really great to support that peer-to-peer -peer learning, the social element as well, uh, collaborative learning. The more that they can rely on each other, um, actually, it's a lot. It's a big time saver for the instructor as well. Uh, we know instructors are spending a lot of time in email, answering questions, and now we have a space uh, within the classroom where somebody can throw up a question and there are other students available to pop in and help out as well. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about is um, how, do we, how do we make this a really human environment? Uh, there are a lot of tools out here that are very formal. Uh, email tends to be formal. Even conversation and discussion that happens within the LMS are formal. So how do we create a more human environment that is more informal? Uh, one of the ways that we've done that is by adding the ability to do reactions. So for any message here, I can add a couple of reactions, which is just another way to express yourself. But of course, we can add a and we even have the quick ability to drop in a GIF at any time as well. Uh, students really appreciate this. Uh, the other thing that I think is available to students that they like is this uh, just-in-time help. So if I'm a student and it's 10 p.m. and I have an assignment due in the morning, um, if I send my instructor an email, they may or may not see it or get to it. But what I can do is see who is online at any time. These little green indicators next to people here, like Kurt, show that Kurt's actually online. So I can message Kurt directly and say, oh, Kurt, I'm so glad you're online. I, I am stuck on, on question seven. What, what, is, what exactly is this asking? Can you help me out here? And we can even jump into a live video video session. So the last piece I wanted to show on mobile was the ability to go live with video at any time, which is really allowing that human element to show up as well. So we get a nice little countdown. I appreciate this because it gives me a second to fix my hair before we go live. Uh, this will then send a notification to the group, letting them know that Carly's just gone live if you'd like to join. Uh, as an instructor, I can broadcast to everyone in the class, but you can also do that in a small group or even one-to-one -one, uh, between students if they wanna meet. Uh, I think especially during this time as we are practicing social distancing, having things like coffee chat groups where students are just getting together just to be together. Uh, we're doing this uh, at our company, trying to create activities where we can just be together, have that conversation, and still feel human. Uh, with that, I will jump over to the desktop experience. Uh, we have Pronto supported uh, both on mobile, standalone in a browser, but also integrated directly with Canvas. Um, one of the things we had shared in the checklist was how to leverage other tools to let people know how you'll be communicating with them. So one way to do that is with Canvas announcements. So you can see here, we have an account Canvas announcements that says, hey, this is our communication plan. You know, as we are, are apart, uh, we wanna keep the conversation going. So here's how we are doing that either at our institution or within that class. Uh, the way Pronto is integrated is right here within the global navigation. And once I click this, you get this nice little chat box. Um, I can honestly say, having worked uh, years with Canvas and looking at hundreds of uh, third-party tools, this is my favorite one. And I may be a little biased, but um, it really feels native to the learning management system. And instructors spend a lot of time in here, so we want to make sure to keep those workflows all central within that learning environment. So here I have the same access to my groups that I do on my phone and I can easily toggle uh, between these groups and see the same feed. 
What I love, 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 love about this integration is Pronto actually recognizes where I'm at within the system. So if I navigate to my economics class and maybe I'm working on adding some content or grading some papers and I want to remind my, my students that something's coming up next week, when I come into this course and launch Pronto, Pronto recognizes that I'm in the Econ 101 class and it goes ahead and opens that uh, chat group directly here for me. So I can send a quick message to my students without even leaving the course space. Uh, the one additional piece of functionality that we have here that's available on a desktop is the ability to share your screen. So how many times <laughs> as instructors do we just want to walk them through a quick concept uh, and want to do that on our laptop? I can come in here. I can either do a live video session or I can actually share my screen with my students and walk them through that. Awesome. So that was a whirlwind tour of, of, uh, of Pronto uh, with the Canvas integration as well. Uh, Jared, I actually have uh, lost my PowerPoint. Do you mind sharing your screen back in? I wanted to share that story uh, about Glendale uh, as we wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I'll stop sharing. There we go. While, while I'm bringing that up, uh, let me ask you guys a question there at Pronto. One of the features that uh, I personally appreciate a lot is the ability for students to interact with each other, uh, whether that's in one of those group channels or directly. What are you hearing from teachers, especially from teachers who are uh, doing this online or remote teaching thing for the first time? How do, how do they feel about students interacting with each other and, and what guidance can you give them for managing that? Yeah, no, I think it's it's a little overwhelming at first, right? Because we're so used to just being physically together that it's not something that we generally have to think about. So the guidance is to be available, right? And that doesn't mean being available 24 seven, but you mentioned the immediacy. And that's something that students in an online environment, when they feel so alone and disconnected, just knowing that other people are there for them, right? Whether that is the instructor or the other students and we are in this together, uh, that, that makes a big difference. So the direction to faculty is really, hey, come in, give them you know, moral support, give them motivation to do their assignments, reminders, just keep them connected to you and make yourself available for things like office hours, which they can do in Pronto as well. Um, and making sure that if you do see students that are falling off, that we're sending them direct messages and trying to pull them back into that experience. Uh, but really also encouraging them to interact with each other uh, because at the end of the day, we are all in this together. <laughs> we're all just trying to figure it out. Yeah, and it reminds me of the, the the quote that I shared about how teaching online is like moving to a different country. It really <laughs> does it really does challenge some of your cultural assumptions about how teaching and learning should happen. Um, and and I I appreciate that in the checklist you guys recommend that teachers number one kind of take some some control early on to organize and structure the use of Pronto uh, in ways that'll be beneficial in ways that they can kind of keep track of, but two, to set expectations with students. And I assume that also means expectations in terms of how students should behave online. We've seen <laughs> some examples yes. in the news of students perhaps misbehaving in online right. environments because they think that they are uh, they're in they're hidden or anonymous. Absolutely. No, no, it's a, that is a really good point. And I think in K-12, uh, that definitely comes up more frequently. Uh, but we definitely do see that in online environments. And What's really great, I think, about Pronto is we we talk to a lot of institutions that say, oh, you know, students are are texting or they're using GroupMe and all of these tools that are outside of the institution, which actually makes it really hard to track, you know, track engagement, but also track if something does happen. You know, if there is harassment or cheating, um, that's something that's really hard to tap into if that's happening on external platforms. So our, our institutions really appreciate that if there is a concern about something like that happening, something inappropriate, that we have transcripts that are available and we can kind of work through that together. Yeah. Well, I know you're going to talk about this story, but it, I think it is a good uh, segue into mm -hmm. A Fabiola story from Glendale Community College. This is this is a college that is using Canvas and Pronto, and I think Fabiola represents some of the ideals that many of us have as educators for what a student-centered learning experience should be like. Um, but at the same time, for those of us who are supporting faculty, we have to find ways for teachers to transition to different ways of teaching 
especially teaching online, uh, that are not radical changes, but incremental changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Fabiola is my hero. <laughs> uh, we had an opportunity to do an interview with her and some of her students. And reading through those transcripts, I was just amazed at you know what the students had to share because it really was so emotional for them. It was This was tapping into that social emotional learning where they said, I feel like my teacher actually cares. And some of the students even talk about them having better engagement and interaction in, in her classroom than even on some of their on-ground classrooms. So she truly is doing um, some incredible things and I think kind of um, is the ideal of what we would all hope to aspire to be uh, in an online environment. If you wouldn't mind, uh, advancing the slide, we also were able to talk to her and say, hey, now that it's been a semester or two on Pronto, like what changes have you seen in the classroom? Uh, and there were a couple of areas where she saw some pretty, pretty big changes. Uh, first and foremost was the time savings. So before Pronto, she would spend about three to four hours per day uh, communicating through things like email and the learning management system. And with Pronto, she was actually able to cut that time in half. So she was able to do it a lot more quickly. She was able to do it from her mobile uh, and students coming in to help each other actually kind of relieved some of that burden for her, from her as well. So huge time savings there. Um, also this, uh, this interesting point of students asking for recommendations, which seems like such an interesting thing. How can a communication platform actually increase that? And what we uncovered was it was because of that human interaction and the relationship between her and the students. She was able to come into an environment that was less formal, she was more approachable, and they were able to develop a relationship where at the end of the class, um, more students were actually asking for those recommendations. Um, next piece, Chair. Um, we also saw uh, changes in participation with assignments. And what we mean by that is students submitting assignments. So before Pronto, she never had 100% uh, students submit you know, an assignment. And with Pronto, she actually had 50% of assignments all students had submitted. And when we took a look at that and said, whoa, what, what's happening there? It was, again, because of those reminders, because they had this channel where she could come in and say, don't forget, don't forget, hey, if you need help, I'm here. And students were able to get that help from each other. So when that support is there, we actually see in her classroom uh, that more students are sub submitting their assignments more frequently. Next one, Jay. Awesome. We also saw grades. So before Pronto, how many students achieved a C or better? About 76%. We did see an increase in that as well. And again, really attribute that to uh, the availability of help and support uh, throughout the entire class. And then the last piece that we looked at was uh, students dropping off, which again is probably one of the biggest concerns uh, in an online environment is, and we do see that, you know, historically, the numbers show that completion in online environments is actually lower than on ground. So with Pronto integrated here with an online environment, we actually saw fewer students uh, dropping out of her class. So pretty phenomenal results uh, in her particular classroom. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Fabiola and hope to be able to do a live session with her where she can actually share her tips and tricks for how to help students be uh, the most successful by leveraging a tool like Pronto in their class as well. Yeah, I know this is just um, one example, but but I'll, I'll tell you what is encouraging for me. Uh, who cares a lot of us, of, of especially uh, underprivileged or at-risk students. Uh, you know, this, this relates to, I think, a couple of the studies that have come out in the last decade that have looked specifically not at a comparison between a face-to-face -face and an online version of a course, but just at the general outcomes of community college students mm -hmm. who are taking online. And, and as we know, community colleges uh, tend to offer a little more than the average number of online courses to students. I think that's in large part in response to students' demand, the need for the flexibility uh, as you know, they tend to be non-traditional students. But what these two major studies found is that community college students actually tend to do worse in online courses. Their, their outcomes are worse. And the research suggests that that is at least in part tied to uh, the level of interaction that they feel in those courses and the level of support that they get from their, their teacher or their classmates. Uh, and certainly we, we've seen at least one survey of student engagement 
that shows that one of the factors that is most predictive of student success is whether or not a student's willing to say, yes, I had teachers who cared about me during my academic career. So I think in some ways we might find that these things tie together. And so that's, again, why um, I'm pretty excited about the work that you guys are doing and especially seeing how that integrates with Canvas. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree, Jared. I've done I've done crash courses in, you know, the positive effects of teacher-student relationships now. And it's incredible how, you know, teachers can actually come in and be that, be that, that shining light and kind of get them through, uh, get them through these courses, especially students yeah. that are coming in underprepared. So do you want to wrap up this piece or would you like me to? Yeah, let, let me uh, just kind of recap some of the things that we've talked about and then open it up for some questions and some discussions. You know, I started this session off uh, by talking about how in online education, especially interaction is so critically important. And there's been, there's been uh, no lack of research or study or theory on the value and the methods of providing quality interaction in online environments. And so those of us who are experienced in online and distance education, hybrid and blended learning, you know, we, we know about the value of online and the, the tools that we can bring to bear on student interaction and engagement. And we know that the methods are important to rethink as an instructor transitions from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to online. Um, so I think there's a lot of things for us as educators who care about this and care about providing a quality online experience to our students um, can do and implement as we work with instructors and faculty members uh, who are adapting to remote teaching. So uh, very excited to co-present this with you guys today at Pronto. Uh, let me turn it over for you guys to wrap up and then we'll take perhaps some questions from the live audience. Yeah, no, just to, to wrap up, that link that Jared is showing on the screen is where you can download the checklist that we talked about. Uh, remember to take note of those pro tips on the right uh, as we move online, kind of great things to keep in mind to make sure that we are keeping our students engaged and connected uh, so they aren't dropping off. Uh, any questions from the group? Hey, Jared, Carly, and Zach, you guys did an excellent job. It looks like a lot of those questions have been answered already. We had a question from Jennifer about how to load Pronto into the Canvas platform and Blake on your team, I think did a pretty good job at already responding to that one. Um, some other little questions that we're, that we're sorting out, like who's the Canvas admin for something. If there's any other questions out there online, feel free to bring them up now. We'll be on for the next couple uh, and we're, we're happy to take them. Jared, anything else you want to yeah. cover? While we're waiting for those questions to come in, I did want to ask you, Zach and Carly, um, this one question, you know, one of the things that I would advise a teacher or, you know, an institution to be cautious of is trying a lot of new things in response to this transition to online. And I say that not because there aren't great solutions out there, but because teachers are already going to be overwhelmed with stuff. Administrators and support staff are already doing everything they can. Um, I, w I wonder what you guys have seen or heard. I mean, you talked about some pretty tremendous response to, you know, making Pronto available to, uh, to teachers during this crisis. But, you know, can you talk a little bit about their attitudes toward a new technology in the mix, especially at the last minute? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll address that. And Zach, if you would like to chime in after that, please, please do. Yeah. But I think the, the attitude has been overwhelmingly positive because of how easy it is to get going. Um, I'm keenly aware, you know, having worked with Canvas for so long that, you know, adopting an LMS when you maybe previously were just posting a syllabus can be a challenge, you know, it can take some time. And so we know that um, virtual conferencing is available. And so it really is about how do we how do we take off bite-sized pieces, right? And do do a little things that have a big impact. And with Pronto, it really is as simple as, as Blake mentioned in the chat, as a 20 minute call to get it integrated. Um, all of the students and teachers and courses are automatically set up. And it really is such an easy to use technology for the half a million students 
that we onboarded last week, we've done zero training sessions, right? So having a, a tool that they can communicate with that really mirrors the way that they're interacting on other communication platforms in their regular life that is intuitive and simple it's really been something that that is that easy to pick up and run with uh, because yeah, there are, there are a lot of tools out there and there are other systems that will take, you know, hours and hours of building and training to get up to speed on. So we really want to focus on how do we give them something that can be in their hands in minutes already set up and really is just a matter of getting in and they know how to use it right off the bat because it's familiar. Yeah, I, I think those are fantastic points. It seems that right now, more than ever, speed to deployment is a really, really big deal. If um, not only can I get technology integrated with, with my campus and get it into the hands of all faculty and students very, very quickly, um, yeah, that's a big deal. But the other big deal here is I, I, do, I just don't have time right now to train everybody on how to use the different tools that we're deploying. And one of the great, great mistakes we made early on uh, with Pronto is we didn't build Pronto first. We built actually a consumer messaging product and um, just turned out that we thought we were building something that was such an excellent solution for friends and family to, to communicate with one another in groups and directly in one-to-one -one communication. And it turned out that schools just loved it. And so we, we, a couple of years ago, started to make that transition. And some of the things that went into ensuring that that consumer experience we had with our product was so good have really benefited us and our customers um, today. Because I can deploy, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, a school administrator, I can deploy Pronto across 20, 30,000 students, and that actual integration process happens, or setup process happens in about, as we just mentioned, 10 or 15 minutes. But faculty and students really don't need to engage with Pronto folks on a daily basis to figure out how, how do I do this and where do I go to do that? It's a very intuitive interface, very frictionless kind of user experience. I think that that's been a, a huge benefit for these schools that have been getting on. As we mentioned earlier, we've had over half a million uh, students get on Pronto in the past week, uh, roughly. And um, that really can only happen in a smooth and, and slick way if, if it is intuitive and, and very user friendly. So we're thankful that we, we made that mistake early on because it's paying some dividends for our users today while we're in kind of a, a crisis mode. Oh, great. Well, guys, thank you so much for sharing this information on Pronto, giving me a chance to talk about one of the things I, I care about deeply, uh, student interaction in online education. Uh, here at Instructure, we love having a really open ecosystem and so many great partners like Pronto who are adding value to the Canvas LMS and extending that value beyond what a lot of us thought was possible in education. So thanks for joining us, guys. And thanks everyone in the audience for participating in the webinar. I hope you click on a couple of these links that we're sharing so you can hear more of Fabiola's story and take a look at Pronto's quick start checklist for teachers who want to keep their students connected as they transition to remote teaching. Thank you, Jared. And to, to everybody watching, um, if, if we didn't make it clear, we'd love to be able to help your, your school make that transition to online. And as part of that, we're uh, extending an offer to everybody to make Pronto free through the end of this semester. And so uh, along with being able to push things out quickly, we can also help you kind of sail through the typically longer decision-making processes by just allowing you to use it for free. So if that's of interest to you, please, please reach out. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Stay healthy and stay engaged. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, everyone.